Greetings, my friend. Welcome to the podcast, Teaching That Transforms, with Dr. Jimmy Knott. Thanks so much for joining me today. Well, we're in a a season, a few episodes into a new season, on one of my most favorite subjects. That's the subject of leadership. I've been a student and practitioner, hopefully of good leadership, for the last uh, 20-plus years. I have to admit, I do not consider myself an expert, uh, still, uh, still learning and growing, and leadership understanding and skill. I'm calling the series, It's All About Leadership, subtitled Be a Leader Worth Following. This is the same title, by the way, of my book, which is available on Amazon, It's All About Leadership, by Jimmy Knott. I encourage you to purchase it. I think you'll find it helpful in this season of teachings on leadership. You can also find the book on my website, jimmynott.com, jimmynott.com, J-I-M-M-Y-K-N-O-T-T dot com. I hope you'll get it. I hope you'll get it. Well, as I said, we continue to look at this all-important subject of leadership. Leadership. It's all about leadership, about being a worth leader worth following. A little bit of review to kind of help us to remember. It's all about leadership. Leadership impacts everything. Leadership is important. Leaders are important. They provide vision and direction and efficiency and team building and accountability. So critically important in every aspect of life, especially our own personal lives as we try to provide leadership to the hardest person in the world to lead, and that's ourselves. Self-leadership. We talked about the very important principle that if we're going to become more effective as a leader, we have two options, work harder or work smarter. Work harder may be difficult for a lot of you who are already humming at, you know, seven and eight, sometimes nine out of ten. Especially the older you get, the more difficult it is to uh, to put in more hours and, and sustain such a pace. So if we're going to increase our leadership effectiveness and efficiency, we have really simply got to have a better understanding of what leadership is and does. And we have to have uh, the willingness to commit ourselves to leadership practices on a consistent basis so that we become part of our moment-by-moment, day-by-day experience. If you remember this principle, your leadership knowledge and ability largely determines your overall influence, effectiveness, and success. So it makes sense. Let's get better as leaders. Let's become the leader that we wish we always had. My definition of leadership is very simple. Who is a leader? A leader is someone, it's a person who influences people to achieve a purpose, to achieve a purpose. Leadership is first and foremost about people, about the relationships with people. And then it's directional. It's about the results. It's not either or about people or results. It's both. It's both. It's less about title leadership is and less about position. Someone, it's possible to have an authority authority in an organization, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're really a leader. Leadership is about positive influence, about serving and helping to others around you. As I heard someone say recently, it's less about being in charge and more about taking care of those in your charge. So what creates a le- influence? What? How do you become a leader worth following? Well, I shared with you a couple of episodes ago that my life and leadership verse is out of Psalm 78, 72 in the Bible, especially the NIV version. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. Asaph, who wrote this, observed something about the life of David that made him at least come to the conclusion he was a leader. And those were three things that created influence and made him a leader worth following. One was integrity of heart. We talked about that last time, authentic character. One was with skillful hands. That's exceptional competence. That will be today's episode. And then next time, it will be relational connection, building relationships with the people around you. Those together are the big rocks in making someone a leader worth following. Let's quickly, quickly review that all-important component of authentic character. Andy Stanley said, character is the will to do right as defined by God, I would add, regardless of personal cost. So that means that character is a choice, a will. It has a standard, what's right, and then it requires sacrifice regardless of personal cost. Character is important, so important, more important than competency. Competency, what we can do may get us in the door but character will keep us in the room. Incompetency. It may slow us down in our career, but weak character could really take us out. 
And the most important, the key character quality is, ing- is integrity, integrity, consistency, consistency in doing what we say we will do. Character is formed. I think the most important facet of forming character that's strong is having a set of core values that you like, love, and that you live by. Those are those personal flags. Those are those core beliefs that we have, and they determine our character. Mine are truth, integrity, excellence, and responsibility. What are yours? Oh, you have them. But are they the ones that you live by and the ones that you should have? So today, it was a quick review. So today, we begin to look at the competency, the competency of a leader worth following. This is that second big component, that second big box in becoming a leader worth following. So let me ask you to start off. (coughs) Who or what? is your greatest asset? Well, frankly, it's you. It's who you are and what you do. We live in a world that is fascinated by human excellence. Human excellence inspires us in every venue, whether it's academics or whether it's the marketplace or whether it's in sports or whether it's art or whether it's uh, in music, wherever it is. We are challenged and mesmerized by human excellence, by great talent. So what does it mean when someone is exceptionally competent? Well, what does it mean to be exceptional? Is it average? Is it normal? Is it mediocre? No, no, no. To be exceptional means to be excellent. It means to be elite. It means to be proficient. So with that in mind, let me give you my definition of exceptional competence. Exceptional competence occurs when a person knows what to do, has the abilities to do it, and the discipline to see it gets done. First, there's knowledge. They know what to do. This usually requires some degree of education, uh, some on-the-job training, uh, some time of experience and practice. And then there are the abilities. Abilities that really, really come in a couple of forms. Uh, there's that inborn, natural, innate talent that uh, that all of us are born with. And then there are skills that we uh, that we that we learn and develop uh, along the way in life. Perhaps our parents, or grandparents, or neighbors, or friends, or coaches, or teachers, or even in school or at, uh, in our in our jobs, uh, we learn uh, to perform certain skills. And then last, you can have the knowledge and you can have the abilities, but you got to have the discipline the work ethic, to see that it gets done. And friend, exceptional competence requires, above everything else, great self-awareness. Being honest with, with you about you. Being honest with others about you. Knowing who you are, and in this case, knowing what you can do exceptionally well. And I think one of the best ways to acquire that is uh, more objectively through a series of assessments. And by the way, on my website, jimmynot.com, jimmynot.com, there are 30 plus different assessments analyzing different areas of life that you can all right there uh, in one place for you. So I would strongly encourage you to go there. So steps are very helpful, but also personal feedback, personal feedback, asking, asking people who know you, know you well, family, friends, moms, dads, spouses, significant uh, others, longtime friends, co-workers, people who know you well, asking them, especially in light of this lesson, what do you think are some of the things that I do well? And then what do you think are some of the things I'm not so good at? And I'm telling you, if you ask five to eight people, you just listen, don't agree or disagree, just listen, you're going to probably hear some consistent abilities that many or all of them say. Self-awareness. Benjamin Franklin said there are three things that are extremely hard. Steel, diamond, and to know oneself. And he said, Jimmy, why is this so hard to know the things we do exceptionally well? Well, I think there are two reasons. Number one, we don't think about it. Because those things that we do exceptionally well, we do them easily and freely, and they just kind of flow out of us. And they have, frankly, probably since we were older children or teenagers. Then a second reason that we uh, find it difficult to know where we are exceptionally competent is we really don't know how to figure it out. We don't know how to figure it out. And again, I think it takes some understanding and some, and some self-awareness, 
but it also takes some intentionality by taking some assessments, and it also includes that important component of involving others through asking them for some feedback. The Stanford Graduate School of Business was asked to recommend the most important capability for leaders to develop, and their answer was almost unanimous, self-awareness. If we want to gain an accurate view of ourselves, we must consistently invest in our internal growth potential, not just in our external success. Tim Irwin, who's written some excellent books, Run with the Bulls, Derailed, excellent book. He writes, effective self-management is heavily dependent on good self and other awareness. A lack of self and other awareness is a common denominator among those who derail. The ability to manage ourselves and to manage our relationships is heavenly dependent upon our perceptiveness for what's going on within us and with others. Self and other awareness employs the ability to discern our own thoughts and feelings as well as the thoughts and feelings of others. Those who derail seem to lack that ability to discern, that lack that ability to discern. So it raises the question, what are our God-given resources that give us the potential for exceptional competence. We are all uniquely resourced and gifted. Well, we can go to the scriptures here. We can go to Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. David writes this psalm, and you just see David almost in a conversation uh, with his creator God. David writes these words, For you, that would be the creator God, you, form, created me, my inward parts. You knitted me, very interesting metaphor. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully. It means awesome, awesome and amazingly made. And that verb there means made with with purpose or for reason. He writes, further, wonderful are your works. Basically saying, wonderful am I because of your creative work. My soul knows it very well. Well, unfortunately, many don't. My frame, my frame, everything about me, Everything, my personality, my intellect, my talents, life experience, and so on, was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven. There's that metaphor again in the depths of the earth. And what David is referring to is obviously uh, his own uh, conception. Then he says in verse 16, Your eyes saw, supervised is literally the word, my unformed substance. So in your book were written, every one of them, every one of what? The days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. David is saying, God, you created me and designed me in the way that I am, and you did that for me to fulfill a unique purpose in my life. So knowing that design, especially knowing what you're exceptionally competent, where you're exceptionally competent, helps us to understand, frankly, our purpose and our why in life. For instance, let me ask you, what's the purpose of a, of a pen, P-E-N? Is it to punch holes when you don't have holes on the left side of the margin? No. But we've used it for that, haven't we? No. It's to write. It's to write. What about uh, scissors? What are, the, what are they designed to do? Well, obviously, they're designed to cut. But how many of us, when there's been a lack of a screwdriver, have turned the scissors up on the sharp end and used it to tighten a, tighten a screw? But that's not they were, what they were designed for. If I were to ask you, what have you been designed for? You should know the answer to that question. You should know that. Okay, let me give you an equation. Our abilities plus our passions and interest, passions or interest, helps us to find our sweet spot in life, perhaps even our dream job. I don't know about you if you're a sports person, but if you play golf or if you've ever swung a bat or if you play any kind of sport with a racket, you know in every one of those uh, uh pieces of athletic equipment, whether it's a bat or a golf club or a racket, there's a sweet spot. And when you hit it there, the the ball just jumps off the racket with greater speed, velocity, and accuracy. Well, when our abilities and our passions come together, that forms our sweet spot, and we all have one. What are you doing? What are you doing when you are at your best and enjoying it the most. What are you doing when you're at your best and enjoying it the most? Listen, friend, if we spend our time trying to be good at everything, we'll probably never be exceptional at anything. Improving your weaknesses has never, ever 
been a good strategy to find success ever. So abilities, abilities, which includes our skills and talents. Those are those God-given capacities that when developed enable us to do certain things extremely well. As I said earlier, there are basically two ways to discover them. One is through assessments, very objective, and then through the process over time of uh, asking others to give us some, uh, uh, some feedback on the things that we do uh, do best. Let me kind of unpack this for a few minutes. All of us have natural talents. These are innate, uh, uh, born with uh, unique uh, abilities and talents. Like for me, it's to teach, it's to lead, uh, it's to inspire or challenge or motivate or encourage uh, others. Some people just have unique abilities for, uh, for academics, uh, for, uh, for art, uh, for uh, athletics, for different sports, for fixing things, for arranging things, for connecting things, for inspiring, for communicating. These are the things that more or less are kind of our native uh, genius in us. These are uh, the things that, uh, that we do, and we do them better than most of the people around us. Uh, what do you, what, what, of all the things that you do, what do you do best? What do you do easily, naturally, without almost any effort? What are the things you enjoy really doing really freely without even being asked? In fact, you would readily do them without pay. And you do them all the time. You don't have to do it just necessarily at work. It's just who you are and what you do. What you do. You've got these natural talents. Now, if these natural talents are developed, recognized and developed, they really can become what's called strengths. Uh, years ago, uh, someone at, uh, at Gallup developed a strengths finder instrument. It's a wonderful, wonderful instrument. And it's about discovering those inborn talents that enable us to grow and to develop and do things exceptionally well. These are those activities that you and I engage in that make us feel strong when we do them. Those are activities and skills that we use that we look forward to using. We're excited and anticipate their use. And while we're doing them, things they tend to flow naturally and easily, and time just kind of flies, flies by. And after we do them, we feel fulfilled and satisfied. So I would encourage you, if you've never taken the Strengths Finder instrument that's available on Gallup, you can certainly research it on the Internet. It costs you a little bit of money, but it would be a great, great discovery. By the way, there are also versions for children. Wouldn't it be wonderful to discover the inborn natural talents that could be developed in the strengths of your, say, 7 to 12-year-old? And then what about for those that uh, are a te uh, teenagers, especially those that are older heading into college? Uh, does it, wouldn't it be prudent to kind of help to discover those inborn natural talents that could be strengths that might help them to decide earlier, uh, as it were, uh, majors? So many kids or parents are spending thousands of dollars for kids to go to school and they graduate and still have no idea what they want to do. Well, taking the strengths finder assessment can, uh, can uh, be of great help uh, to you along the way. So we got these these abilities, both some of them that are natural and innate and some that are skills developed uh, over time, then you add those to our, to our passions, our passions. Passions are those interests and desires that you and I have, uh, maybe for certain people or people groups, uh, maybe for certain subject or topics in life, and maybe even for certain activities in our life. Our passions is what we enjoy doing. These are things that truly, truly energize us in doing them. They give us focus and energy, whereas our non-passions tend to drain us and to bore us in what we're doing. Now, unlike passions, these natural talents and abilities, I think they're really, uh, in many ways, are inborn and with us all of our lives. Whereas sometimes our passions, for especially for people groups and interests, they might tend to, as it were, change uh, a little bit uh, uh, over uh, over time. So, being exceptionally competent, knowing we're exceptionally competent, is so critically, critically important. Let me deal with something that's very important along this subject of exceptional competence. Even once you discover what you're good at, you have to just, uh, you have to also practice how do you get better at what you do? How do you increase your competency? How do you become better at the work that you do? Well, let me give you uh, some suggestions on how to get better. Number one, clearly identify. That's kind of what we've been talking about. Clearly identify, label and name your best abilities, what you're really good at, and I would encourage you, you're not so good at, your non-abilities, and intentionally, intentionally allocate those resources. Discover what you're not good at and do not enjoy, and stay away from that as much as possible. 
give yourself permission to do what you do best most of the time and manage around your non-talents. The best you'd ever be, no matter how much time and effort and energy you put in them, would be average, but you would be drained in the process. For me, as I've already mentioned, my uh, top uh, abilities are teaching and leading and inspiring or igniting others to grow. And I spent so much time growing those. You say, well, Jimmy, how do you do that? Well, that's a second way we can increase our competency. Gain all the knowledge, all the knowledge, understanding that you can and all the ways that you can to learn more about your top abilities. That kind of goes back to our definition. Exceptional competency knows what to do. There's so much information out there on different abilities, whether it's on podcasts, uh, interviewing others, uh, whether it's on YouTube. Uh, go find knowledge on the abilities that are your top abilities. Next, number three, select specific skills. So again, part of the definition. You can exceptionally competent people know what to do, but they also uh, have the skills and the abilities to do it. So select specific skills. Skills are learned to work on to improve that will enhance your best abilities, that will enhance your best abilities. And then next, number four, deliberately practice, deliberately, intentionally practice using those top abilities and talents to gain valuable experience, to gain valuable uh, experience. Listen, if you want to get really, really good at your job, just imagine three buckets. Imagine three buckets. Uh, first bucket's got your job, your job. Could you write down in that bucket what you specifically do day after day. Uh, it's probably not your title. That probably is not descriptive enough. Exactly what is your job? Mine is to, and has been for years, very clear, to create and communicate content that encourages people to grow. That encourages people to grow. So what's your job? In a, in a word, two words, phrase, certainly no more than a sentence. The next bucket is task or functions. What tasks or functions are required for you to do that job that you just described? What's required? Like for me to create and communicate content, do it night growth, I gotta research, I gotta write, I gotta edit, I gotta teach, I gotta I gotta motivate, I gotta challenge, I gotta tell stories to challenge and motivate growth. And then the far right bucket is about your abilities, your abilities, your talents and skills put together. Those are the talents and skills and abilities that you need to perform what was in the middle bucket, your task, your task. Like for me, it takes, you know, it takes uh, d uh, discipline. I'm, you gotta be, uh, gotta be a learner. I've gotta, uh, uh, I've got to develop my communication abilities, both in uh, orally and uh, in writing and podcast and so on. You don't have to work harder to get better at your job. You have to work smarter. And one of the best ways to do that is identify your abilities and then, to, and then work hard to grow them and to develop them. So clear to identify your abilities, gain all the knowledge you can, select specific skills to develop, deliberately practice those top talents. Number five goes back to our definition of exceptional competency. Discipline yourself to stay focused and work hard. That takes time. It's like getting in shape. You don't go to the gym once for eight hours to get in shape. It's over the long haul, over the long haul, over the long haul. Very important. Number six, share the knowledge of your best abilities with others, especially your supervisor, your boss, your manager, your leader. Don't assume they know. Inform them of the two or three things that you do freely and easily and consistently well because they are in a position to position you to use those most of the time. It's a sad but true statistic, according to Gallup. Only about 12 to 15% of the American workforce gets to do what they do best most of the day at work. That's right, 12 to 15%. Can you imagine what would happen in the American workforce if we could help people as leaders to discover what they do, what people who are uh, we are responsible for do best? What would that do to engagement, fulfillment, productivity? What would it do to uh, bottom line profitability? I'm telling you, it would go off the chart. And then last, number eight, keep growing and developing your best abilities. Keep growing and developing your best leader, best ability. And that's not just for you. You know, if you're a leader, you're, you either know or you're discovering what you do best and you're growing and developing. But you're also investing in the people that you are responsible for who are around you. Help them to know what their best abilities are and then helping them to develop them 
as well. So, what are your top abilities? Do you know them? It matters. Let me close with, what are some benefits from exceptional competence? What's it, what are the dividends? What's the return on the investment of knowing and developing and using our top abilities most of the time? Well, there are many, and I'm only going to mention these few. First, it will increase your engagement, your engagement at work. We're six times, six times more engaged at work if we get to focus on what we do best most of the time. Increases engagement. Engagement goes up, so much else is effective. It increases your fulfillment. Your well-being goes up threefold when you know what you do best and you're doing it most of the time. It gives us a greater sense of meaning and purpose and pride and confidence. Third, it increases your productivity. We get our best results when we get to do what we do best. And then the last I'll mention, it will increase your opportunity. Doing what you do best most of the time will be noticed. It will open the door to future opportunity. It will open the door to future opportunity. The writer of Proverbs wisely said in Proverbs 22, 29, Do you see someone skillful in their work? They will stand before kings, people in authority. They will not stand before obscure men. They will not. A leader worth following practices exceptional competency. But a warning as I wrap things up, never let what you can do well, your competencies, outrun who you are, your character. As I said before, a lack of competency will slow you down in your life and career, but a lack of character could take you out. So, what are your top best abilities? Where are you exceptionally competent? Think about that, my friend, and know that it can make a huge and significant difference. Thank you for listening to Teaching That Transforms with Dr. Jimmy Knott. Remember, Teaching only transforms when we consistently practice. I look forward to joining you the next time.